before we keep going. It's easy to let your just open your mouth and sing these songs when you sing them every year. But there's meaning to them. And sometimes we forget it.
of our appreciation just as a way to say that, that we appreciate you. There's also a treat bag, a gift for each kid uh, that they will get in their kids' classes this morning. Uh, so and, and if they don't make it back to kids' class, we'll be happy to get them one as well. But just a, a small uh, a gift for our kids to let them know that they're loved and appreciated as well. Next Sunday morning will be New Year's Eve. We will have service next Sunday morning at 1030 as usual, just like normal. Uh, but then also next Sunday evening we'll have our watch night fellowship and service. So we'll meet here uh, at 8 o'clock. Uh, bring a drink that you like. Bring uh, finger food and any games you might like to play. We're just going to hang out and fellowship and play games and, and have some fun that evening. And then about 1130 or so we'll come in and we will worship together for a few minutes and we will pray. We will pray out the old year and pray in the new year together uh, on that day. I would encourage you to be here next Sunday morning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay out kind of the vision and then the emphasis for what we're going to go for in 2018. Uh, and that, the, the, it's called 30, 30, 9, and 10. And I've been kind of peeling back the layers of that in Wednesday night prayer meeting, kind of sharing what each of those numbers mean and what we're going to focus on. But I'm going to kind of lay out the challenge for us next Sunday morning. So I would love for, for everybody in our church to be here next Sunday morning to get that challenge and to be ready for that. And then don't forget, as we roll into the new year, January 1st through the 21st, the first three weeks of the new year, we are going to have our all-church fast again. And I'm not dictating what you fast or how you fast, but I am encouraging us as a church to fast, um, to fast something. I know some people have told me they're going to fast social media, no social media for 21 days. Some of us are going to do a Daniel fast where you only eat fruits and vegetables for 21 days. So, so I just want you to be prayerful, intentional about that, and, and really seek after the Lord with us in, in, in that really intentional way for the fast at the beginning of the new year. Anything else this morning that I've forgotten to mention or, or share? Hopefully. If you guys want to stand back up with me, I'm just going to say a word of prayer. And I'm going to get out of the way so we can worship a little more. Father, we're thankful this morning for what it means to gather in your house, in your name, with your people. We're thankful for, for what we celebrate in this Christmas season. We're thankful, Lord, that, that even though we get to spend time with family and, and we maybe get gifts and we have these awesome dinners and meals together, that the, the reason behind it all is we celebrate the coming of, of your son, Jesus. And so in this time that we have together this morning, we want to focus on that. We want to truly, intentionally sing and declare the praises of it and, and look into the Word and see what it tells us about it and spend time interacting with you. So God, we give you this time this morning. We, we intentionally seek after you. We intentionally celebrate and honor and worship the reason for the season in, in this time that we have together this morning. So have your will and have your way as we continue in this worship service this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
sending our kids over for their time together this morning. to deny that the single most powerful figure, not merely in these two millenniums, but in all human history, has been Jesus of Nazareth. And so today, across the world, on, on this Christmas Eve, on this Sunday, uh, over a billion people from every continent will stop and will celebrate and will worship as, as we think about the birth of Jesus, who was called Emmanuel. Which, which literally means, which literally translates as God with us. When Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, wrote down these words that he was given in Isaiah 7.14, it explains this to us a little bit. Isaiah writes, Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call His name Emmanuel. And I wonder, could Isaiah have really even imagined how enduring and how extensive the reality of Emmanuel, the reality of God with us, would really become? Could, I, could Isaiah have imagined that 2,000 years later, that, that people would still need to hear the good news? And that as we gather in this season that's marked by our longings and our desires to be together, really... Our hearts' desires and our longings can only be filled partly when we gather together with family and with friends. Could Joseph have imagined what all this would have meant? This name, Emmanuel, God with us, it wasn't written in some greeting card with, with some hokey sentimental greetings. And it didn't come with soft pictures, but it came with the stark reality of human life. And, and so as, as he reflected on it, and he had to have reflected on that name, Emmanuel, God with us, there's so much that he probably had to wonder about. Bethlehem, the city that Jesus is born in, was the most unlikely city. It was the last place. It was the least place. There was Rome, and there was Ephesus, and there was Alexandria. But Bethlehem was nowhere. Most people left this little ghost town of Bethlehem to go and be somewhere. So it shouldn't really surprise us that, that there was no room at the only inn in town that night. Because when the census that the, the Gospels refer to required that everybody come back to their hometowns, Bethlehem had a whole lot of people who said they were going to get out of that nowhere town who had to come back home to be registered for the census. So why that town? Why Bethlehem? Why this little podunk nobody town would God choose for the Savior of the world to be born? I think God shows us that it was a city so common that if God would send His only Son to be born into that kind of city, that no city, that no place could be forgotten or far from God. That nobody ever would have to think that their city was too little or too lost for God. Because after all, He was Emmanuel. He was God with us. But what about the place, the barn? Joseph had to wonder, right? Our nativity scenes today with our European influence, we probably don't depict just how dark and cold it really was where Jesus was born. In fact, a lot of historians, as they've, as they've researched and, and written about the birth of Jesus, they, a lot of scholars will tell us it probably was not a barn or a stable or a building, but it very well might have actually been a small cave an inset into the hillside that allowed for very a little bit of protection 
for the animals. So literally, it was just this indentation, this, this cave in the side of the hill. And, and then there was this carved, cut out place in the rock for the animals to eat of. And so the place where Jesus lay was stone cold and saliva stained. Why that kind of place? Why not the Bethlehem Hilton or a palace or a mansion? Because it was a place so common that it showed us that no place could be forgotten or far from God. That no place would ever be too dark or too dirty or too cold or too lonely for God's presence. Because a lot of people would look up at the majesty of God's callings and, and they'd see that God comes in that kind of situation. And they'd know that even in their darkness, even in their circumstances, that God would be with them. He was Emmanuel, God with us. Now his name, Joseph had to have wondered because we think of Jesus as this thing with just holy, reverential awe. But in that culture, Jesus was simply the Greek form of Yeshua. It, which is their translation of Joshua. So really, it was as common as any name could be in their culture. It was certainly not fitting for a king. Because you would, you would think of a king having a name that would be distinctive and would set them apart. Today, people pick names for their children that set them apart. That celebrities get rid of anything common and they choose something distinct, right? Blue Ivy, North. Like, let's come up with the most outlandish name we can so everybody who will know who our kid is. But Jesus is given the most common name that he could possibly be given. God says, just call him Yeshua. Just call him Jesus. It was a name so common that it showed us that nobody would ever be forgotten or nobody would ever be too far from God to be able to be reached because he is Emmanuel. He is God with us. Now, perhaps Joseph wondered what he'd look like, his appearance. After all, he wasn't likely to get to see himself in his son, but he could at least expect something extraordinary with God being the father of this child. But no, just as, just as God prophesied through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53, 2, my servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. Like a tender green shoot out of dry ground. A dry ground does not produce a particularly strong physical life. And, and he says there was nothing to attract us to him. He was a guy who could pass in the crowd and not think twice about him or notice him. In fact, the Bible tells us that Jesus often would slip away into the crowds. And, and when, when the time came for Judas to betray Jesus, Judas had to go and identify him. Jesus, Judas had to go and give him that kiss on the cheek so they even knew which one was Jesus. What was God trying to communicate to us? That he didn't come to impress us. That he didn't come to intimidate us. But he truly came to be one of us. To be with us. With an appearance so common that nobody's appearance would ever be forgotten. Nobody's appearance would ever be too far from God. There was nothing to distinguish Him so that there could be nothing in appearance to disqualify us. Because He was Emmanuel. God with us. Perhaps Joseph wondered about the guest list. Because uh, when a child is born, we naturally think about who to call first. It's a proud moment. It's a, it's a time of honor. And we're told in the Bible that an announcement did break forth and, and that for a brief moment a multitude of angels could be seen and heard providing this, this greatest choir that ever sang on the earth. But their audience? Somewhere around four shepherds and 175 sheep. It was not exactly a Martha Stewart kind of affair. Shepherds weren't just simple people, but we saw last week that, that shepherds were despised by the orthodox religious leaders of the day. That the constant demands of the sheep made it impossible for them to observe all the details of the, of the ceremonial law, all of the religious laws and regulations. There was no opportunity for self-righteousness in the hearts of the shepherds. But they did understand one thing. They understood the cost of the sacrifice that was made for our sins. Because these shepherds who lived on the outskirts of town, they had birthed and they had raised and they had cared for countless lambs that were used in the temples for sacrifices. They were the ones who, who looked after the temple lambs and they were the first ones who would see the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. 
Their lack of pretense might have been their only qualification. They were visitors so common that no visitors would ever be forgotten or far from God. Because He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. Maybe, maybe Joseph wondered about himself. And he wondered about Mary. Could any two people have been less likely to, to have God involved and God use them in their lives? The angels must have been shocked when, when they looked at one another and they realized these were no king. This was not a king and queen they were going to to take this message. And these were not even religious leaders. She was a Jewish peasant girl who had barely outgrown her acne. And, 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 and it was in a culture where all respect and honor was given to people with age and wisdom. And she was betrothed. She was hooked up with this guy named Joe, a carpenter, a nobody. Think about it. God is going to have dinner every night with him in the flesh. The source of all wisdom is going to grow up calling this guy dad. A common laborer is going to be charged with giving food to the Son of God. What if he gets laid off? What if he gets cranky? What if he decides to, to run away with somebody else? The fate of the world is resting on the response of two rural Mideastern teenagers. They were people so common that no common person would ever be forgotten or be far from God because He is Emmanuel. He's God with us. Even, even more deeply, perhaps, Joseph wondered about the child's reputation. After all, they weren't married. What in the world was God doing? Why didn't God choose a married couple? After all, it's God who fashioned us male and female and, and called forth these covenants for making marriage. Marriage is kind of His thing. And nine months of awkward explanations, nine months with this lingering scent of scandal, it seems today when we look at it like, like God arranged the most humiliating circumstances possible for this entrance to avoid any charge of favoritism. Small towns don't treat young boys who grow up with questionable, questionable paternity very well. Joseph must have wondered, God, he'll be looked down on from the start. He might be a social outcast. You're sending him into the world as an illegitimate child. Why? Because we all may wonder about our legitimacy. Deep down, we all may wonder if we're a mistake. We all may wonder if our existence was really intended. If there's really, really any purpose or meaning to our unique existence. We live in a world where deep down inside, we all fear becoming the outcast. Where prejudice and popularity can leave us out. Why would such shame be cast on God's own life among us? Perhaps his mind would recall what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah long ago about the shame that Jesus would endure 33 years later. Isaiah 53, starting in verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs. And carried our sorrows. Yet we have seen him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet it was the will of God to crush him. He, he, was, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many. No doubt Joseph knew something of his own shame. That, that common sense of shame that separates us from God himself. In this tiny baby, Isaiah prophesied it before Jesus was born, that in this tiny baby, that in Jesus who would be born, that God Himself would now bear this shame. That God would bear a shame that's so common that nothing shameful could ever make us too far from God. And there lies the wonder to end all wondering. 
If you've ever wondered if God could be with you, could really be with you, I want you to know this morning you can never be out of God's reach because He truly is Emmanuel. He truly is God with us. And yes, we want this world to be filled with God, but I also want my world to be filled with God. Jesus didn't simply come into a world out there, but to enter my world right here. Every crack and every crevice of the human life. And through His presence, our world can become sacred again. Because at the birth of Jesus, nobody would leave this event the same way. Someone had entered their life. Joseph's house would never be the same because God had entered. There would still be stress and there would still be strife, but God was with them. He was a man. The, the shepherds' dark and quiet nights would, would never be quite the same. I'm sure it still got cold and they were still short on human conversation and companionship, but God was with them because He was Emmanuel. For the wise men that, that later on would come from the east, the skies would never be seen the same. No doubt they would continue to study the skies and they would continue to counsel kings as they, as they had done. But now they knew that God reigned over the stars and He stood above any king that they could ever counsel because God was with them. He was Emmanuel. And maybe the, the biggest surprise was that this was only the beginning. That this baby would not only enter the lives of all that He touched, but that He would live and He would die and He would rise again for every life He ever created. And He came not only to be incarnate in this world, but in our worlds. Not only to be born in this world, but to be born in us. He came to give life, allowing us to be born again as we offer Him our lives. Jerome was a, a church father who translated the Greek manuscripts into Latin. And he put the Bible in the, in the language of the people. And he purposefully lived in Bethlehem. He, he went and lived in Bethlehem where Jesus was born. And one night while he was living in Bethlehem, he had this dream that Jesus visited him. And the dream was so real to him that he collected all of his money and he offered it to Jesus as a gift. But the Lord said, I don't want your money. And so Jerome rounded up all of his possessions and all the things that he had. And he tried to give them to Jesus, but Jesus said, I don't want your possessions. And then Jerome re recalled this moment in his dream where he turned to Jesus and asked, what can I give you? What do you want? And Jesus simply replied, give me your sin. Give me your very self. Because that's what I came for. I came to take away your sin. Give me your sin. He truly is Emmanuel. He truly is God with us. We are never out of reach. We are never too far gone. We are never alone. And today God says, I'm with you. Folks, Jesus was not some high and lofty version of God. He's not some distant, untouchable, unapproachable <coughs> deity. He, he truly is Emmanuel, God with us. And so this morning, as, as a part of our, our worship service, we're going to take communion. It's, it's a reminder that, that Jesus told us to observe. That we would continue to be reminded of what Isaiah wrote about, that we read earlier in Isaiah 53. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with His wounds were healed. Jesus came and He was born for a purpose. Ultimately, to make a long story short, He was born to die. He was born to give His life on a cross so that our sins would be forgiven. The ultimate Christmas gift wasn't given under a tree, but it was given on a tree. And what we have to remember is that even in the heartwarming story of His birth in a manger, there was a weighty purpose in His coming. Check out this video. 